Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this Hurricanes at Home presentation. Uh, we're very glad you could make it and uh, hope you, you find this uh, interesting and uh, you learn something from it. Uh, and we'll hopefully we'll have fun talking to you as well. My name is John Bravender. I'm the Warning Coordination Meteorologist at the National Weather Service Central Pacific Hurricane Center. And with me are several of my colleagues who will be talking to you throughout the webinar. We'll introduce them momentarily. Uh, right now, I'll just mention a couple of things really quick. You were put into, uh, you're automatically muted right now. Um, so uh, you won't be able to say anything. Hopefully you can hear us well. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them into the question box and we'll, we'll see those pop up. And you either try to type back an answer or address them as we pause throughout this webinar and to try to answer those questions. So, so please, uh, please ask away. We certainly appreciate those. And uh, at the end, uh, if you have anything and want to say anything, there's a, if you click the little hand button, it'll raise your hand, you'll bring your attention to us so we can unmute you and let you ask a question at the end as well. With that, we'll step forward. I have a, a short video to show you um, a little bit about NOAA in general and what we do throughout the Pacific. So it gives you a little overview of what NOAA does in across the Pacific region. Hopefully you caught a, a couple of weather aspects in that video, uh, weather balloon launch and some of the aircraft observation that we do flying through hurricanes. We'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that coming up. To start off with, we'll do a little few introductions. And before we introduce ourselves, we'll introduce some tropical cyclones that have um, affected us uh, in Hawaii. Uh, over the recent time periods. Actually, not so recently, going back to 1982, Hurricane Eva uh, brushed just past Kauai, uh, caused a lot of damage, knocked out power. It was a late season hurricane uh, in November, uh, near the end of hurricane season, and brought a lot of damage. 10 years later, Hurricane Niki made uh, landfall as a major hurricane on Kauai. Uh, some areas are still damaged. Uh, over 25 years later from that. More recently, uh, Hurricane e or Tropical Storm Isel and uh, Tropical Storm Darby hit the, the Big Island in 2014 and 2016. And maybe you remember Hurricane Lane from uh, two years ago, uh, came up from the south, caused a lot of concern, and actually brought a lot of rainfall, especially to the Big Island. We'll talk about where that rainfall, that comes into play record-wise as well, coming up. So a little bit about ourselves. As I mentioned, my name is John, the Warning Coordination Meteorologist, been with the National Weather Service for over 20 years, and uh, 
really got into meteorology in high school, after high school and into college, uh, flying with Civil Air Patrol, got interested in weather there and ended up getting an atmospheric science degree and joining the National Weather Service, and here I am. Also joining uh, us and speaking to you uh, through this webinar are my colleagues. Um, why don't we uh, introduce ourselves? Uh, Leanne, would you like to go first? Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. My name is Leanne Eaton, and I am an emergency response specialist with the National Weather Service. And like John, or a little bit after John, I got uh, interested in being a meteorologist in college. I was a little bit undecided on what I wanted to do, but I knew that I liked math and I liked science, and that's meteorology is very heavy into the math and sciences. Um, so if you like those things, potentially this is a career for you. But I, what I like about meteorology is that it combines the science aspect and then also helping people. So in my role now as emergency response specialist, I try to help uh, put out the message of any of the impactful weather that's going, going to be happening in your area. So I'll pass it off to Vanessa. Great, thanks Leanne. Hi everybody, my name is Vanessa Almanza and I am a meteorologist with the National Weather Service Forecast Office in Honolulu. Uh, I got interested in meteorology in high school. Um, one of our career counselors gave me one of those aptitude tests and I was more apt to be a pilot or a meteorologist. And I started to look into what meteorologists do and it really interests me. And so I pursued a college career in it and ended up in the National Weather Service. I'm very happy. And I'll pass it off to Eric. Hi everyone, so my name is Eric Lau. Um, I'm also a meteorologist with the National Weather Service. I was born and raised in Hawaii, so I got interested in, in weather when uh, Hurricane Iniki uh, came by and uh, wreaked havoc on the island of Kauai. So that was a whole day spent uh, just glued to the TV watching that system uh, move through. So another aspect of our jobs is, uh, is um, I'm working with a lot, a lot of computers. So that's another aspect that we'll be talking about later if you're interested in weather. Um, yeah, that's another uh, potential uh, field to specialize in in the National Weather Service. So I'll pass it over back to John. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll, everybody listening to the audience or listening to the audience, uh, as we go through this, I'll, I'll just mention again, feel free to answer que ask questions and we'll, we'll answer them as we go through. And we'll jump in first with Vanessa uh, for the first part of uh, the presentation. Awesome. All right. Thanks, John. Um, so I would like to ask everybody what they think a meteorologist does or, um, yeah, what do they do? If you want to just drop in the comments uh, what you think a meteorologist is and what they do, that would be great. I'll give you a few seconds. Do that. Okay. All right, so a meteorologist is somebody who studies and forecasts the weather. Uh, you're probably more properly seeing people on TV like Guy Hoggy or Jennifer Robbins. Um, there's also meteorologists that work for airlines and meteorologists that work for shipping companies, meteorologists that work for energy companies forecasting wind and solar energy, and there's even meteorologists who do hurricane forecasting, which is what we're mostly here to talk about. Next slide, please. So we'll start with the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. And the image to the left, uh, this is the building which is located at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. This is where the Central Pacific Hurricane Office is. And this is where all of the hurricane forecasts for the Central Pacific come from. Next slide, please. So now can you tell me where the National Weather Service forecast offices are? Now, if you said everywhere, you are correct. 
there are over there are 123 forecast office around the nation, including Hawaii, Guam, and America Samoa. And what I didn't tell you earlier is that the weather forecast office is actually co-located with the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. So a lot of the forecasters that work at the weather forecast office also work at the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. So what's the difference between the Central Pacific Hurricane Center and the local forecast office? Well, the local forecast office where I work, they tell you if it's gonna rain or snow, if it's gonna be windy, and this is all local stuff for the state of Hawaii. Next slide. What they also forecast, this office, particularly the office in Honolulu is special because it's actually four offices in one. So not only are we the Central Pacific Hurricane Center office for an, and the local forecast office, but we also are the Marine forecast office where we tell boaters and uh, ships and surfers and other people who spend time on the water what the water conditions are gonna be like. Are there gonna be big waves? Are there gonna be um, winds that boaters should be worried about? And then the fourth office that's also located at the University of uh, Hawaii location is the aviation forecast office. And these forecasters communicate not only with forecasters on the mainland, but also international uh, forecast office to help pilots navigate around thunderstorms. Would you want a, your plane to fly into a thunderstorm? I wouldn't think so. So we help with that. And with that, I will pass this, pass it on to Eric. All right, thanks, Vanessa. Uh, hope you're all having a good day so far. Um, so this is a Hurricanes at Home presentation, so we're going to get more into the details about tropical cyclones and hurricanes. Um, so we want to think about the term tropical cyclone. Um, you've probably heard a lot of people use these terms, such as a tropical cyclone, a tropical storm, hurricane, or a tropical depression. Um, even tropical disturbance and all these terms can really get confusing so we want to break it down for you. Uh, tropical cyclone is a, a generic term that's used by meteorologists to describe a uh, rotating organized system of clouds and thunderstorms uh, that originates over tropical waters. So if you look at the picture uh, that's shown on the screen right now you can see various storms uh, across the central pacific and the eastern pacific uh, where you see all the way to the left, you see a tropical depression in Genevieve. Um, you also see Hurricane Isel uh, to the east of Hawaii, and then to the east of Isel is a tropical storm, Julio. Um, so all these systems, no matter no matter what uh, what stage they're in, either a depression, a hurricane, or a storm, um, they are all classified as a tropical cyclone. So we do have a poll question for you uh, put into the uh, the poll box, um, what is the strongest stage of a tropical cyclone? Okay. So you should see the, the poll question on the screen. So click your answer, choose one, and then click submit. Okay, looks like most people have voted. We'll close that and share the results. 100% of the people say hurricane. Well, oh, that's excellent. That's a very good answer. It seems like um, everybody here is a tropical cyclone expert. So we'll dig a little deeper into these terms now. Um, shown in the next slide here is all the different stages of uh, hurricanes. Um, so if you hear something being called a tropical disturbance. Um, it means it's a rotating system, kind of in the early stages. That's a picture on your left. There's really no wind classification yet, but you'll notice that there's a, a thunderstorms that are forming and trying to, to rotate around each other. So there's really not any wind classification. Um, as we move to the next slide, not the next slide, but the next picture in, the, in this frame, 
um, you'll see that the, the next in the development is a tropical depression. Uh, there's thunderstorms that are more organized and the circulation is becoming a little bit more apparent. Um, and winds are really uh, generated less than about 38 miles per hour. Uh, the next stage is the tropical storm. Uh, when the winds are in the winds within the circulation are uh, above 39 miles per hour, but less than 73 miles per hour. Um, this is also when the system gets its name. So tropical depression and a tropical disturbance, they don't have names yet. But once we get to a tropical storm stage, that's when they get their name. And we'll talk a little bit about the naming process in a little bit. Uh, the last stage here is hurricane, as you see in the fourth image. Uh, winds are greater than 74 miles per hour. And, uh, you know, also in the Western Pacific, they're also called typhoons. So generally in this hurricane stage and also the typhoon stage, they're actually the same, but just in different locations. Uh, here's a little tidbit for you. The, the strongest hurricane has been uh, recorded in the, off of the Gulf of Mexico back in 2015. This was Hurricane Patricia, and Patricia had wind speeds of about 215 miles per hour. So hurricanes can get pretty, pretty strong. And we'll, we'll talk about the, uh, the different categories in the next slide here. So how do we group these hurricanes? Um, <clears throat> you might hear people talking about the different categories from category one through category five. But once the tropical cyclone reaches hurricane strength, uh, Remember, at least uh, 74 miles per hour is when we have a hurricane. So you see the meteorologists talk about the different stages and it can really tell us how strong the system is. And for that, we use this scale called the Saffir-Simpson Saffir -Simpson scale. It was developed by a civil engineer. His name was Herb Saffir and also a, a meteorologist, Robert Simpson. Uh, they teamed up together and, and they looked at uh, past historical systems and they, they've um, classified each of the different stages of tropical, uh, tropical cyclones and hurricanes. So they built this scale to really tell us how strong the hurricane is based on wind speeds only. Um, it doesn't really tell us how much impact or other uh, with the other hazards such as uh, heavy rain or, and flooding and, and other impacts from hurricanes, but really generally just the winds. So we start off with category one with uh, winds between 74 and 95 miles per hour and then category two through three, four and five with uh, winds up above uh, 157 miles per hour. So as we talked about earlier, Hurricane Patricia was definitely greater than 157 miles per hour. Um, that would have been a category five hurricane. So those, uh, those systems can be quite devastating and really, really catastrophic if it reaches uh, land. So on the next slide, we're gonna look at a, a satellite image. Uh, this is a satellite uh, from a geostationary satellite, which is uh, you know, sitting up in space and looking back down towards Earth. Well, one of the sensors on there is uh, the infrared sensor, which measures the temperatures of, of the surface. And you can see on the, on the, around the uh, system, there's grays and whites. Those indicate warmer temperatures, so it's closer to the surface. But as we get closer and closer to the center of the system uh, on this hurricane, this is Hurricane Lane, um, you can see the reds and the yellows. And as we get closer to the eye, it's, it turns, the colors are black and, and more white. Uh, those are really, really cold temperatures that's measuring the, the tops of these thunderstorms. Um, so, uh, satellite imagery is one of the, the major tools that we have as meteorologists to really uh, interrogate the system and, and to really learn about the different characteristics of this particular system. So um, <clears throat> we're going to go into our next poll here and we're going to ask you, based on this image here, where do you think the strongest winds are found? So again, just like the, the previous poll, um, select one of the following answers and then click submit. Okay, it looks like we got most people answered. I'll close that and share the results. All right, so about 75% of you chose the eye wall. Um, that, is the, that is indeed where we find the strongest winds, um, typically in the eye in the center of the system. 
um, we typically have very low winds or, or almost calm winds. So we'll, we'll take a look at, at that later. Um, but usually the eye wall, uh, that is where the strongest winds are and also where the rain is usually the heaviest and where the damage, the most damage occurs. Uh, this is the ring of, of strong winds that really surround the eye of the system. And the eye is the, one of the major characteristics of a hurricane. Um, and it's definitely uh, in an interesting place because in the, center of the, in the center of the storm where the eye is, the winds are quite calm. And, and sometimes uh, if you so happen to be in the eye of a hurricane, if you look, look up, you can actually see a blue sky. Um, so that is a really definitely a, a, an inter interesting place. Um, <clears throat> so this next slide here, we're going to cut. Let's imagine if you use a knife and you cut the hurricane in half. So we're going to take a look at the different parts of the hurricane. Um, this is what it's called a cross section when you cut something in half. And remember how we said the eye has calm winds and little clouds? This is because it's a, it's a warm core system, which means the surface winds are spinning counterclockwise. But as these cloud bands and the spirals that you can see there surrounding the eye, those are all flowing into the center of the system. Um, and you can see how the, the clockwise air is uh, spinning as it goes up into the system. And then um, that's where we have a little bit of a high pressure where it's kind of pushing down and suppressing any kind of cloud development there. So that's why we have uh, uh, some calmer winds and, and clear skies over there. The, the next slide here is, is an interesting slide. So we're still taking a look at parts of the hurricane, but we also have uh, different tools that we can use to get the information on the strength of the system. Um, this is a global precipitation measurement from a satellite image of uh, Hurricane Lane back in 2018. And what the satellites are doing is it's uh, it has these sensors that can that can uh, penetrate through the clouds and measure precipitation. Um, so what you're seeing here is a 3D animation of the, uh, the uh, precipitation field across the center of the storm. So you can see there's a hole in the center that's depicting where the eye is, but also the reds and the yellows is where all the stronger thunderstorms are and the heavier rainfall. So definitely some, some really cool tools that we have to, to take a look at the storm itself. Um, so the next slide here, we want to talk about a little bit uh, where hurricanes form and where they move. Um, these little individual lines that are plotted here on this map show uh, is the history of tropical cyclones across the eastern and the central Pacific. So you see the majority of the storms are formed right off the coast of Mexico. Um, and you can see generally the, the movement from east to west across the eastern Pacific and into the central Pacific. Um, so this next slide here where we, where we depict the orange, the yellow line there, um, that's a box where it's the area of responsibility for the Central Pacific Hurricane Center. So anytime there is a storm or a hurricane or tropical cyclone that either forms within that box or forms in the Eastern Pacific and moves into the box, then the Central Pacific Hurricane Center uh, located at the University of Hawaii at Manoa will take over responsibility for forecasting that particular system. <clears throat> so we're going to learn a little bit more about how hurricanes get their name. So we're going to pass it on to Leanne to talk about that. Thanks, Eric. So earlier, uh, what Eric said is that a tropical cyclone, once it reaches the tropical storm strength, is when it gets its name. So you may ask, why do we name them? Because back before the 1950s, they were just calling them Storms 1, Storms 2, Storms 3, but people kept getting confused on which storm was which. So they thought that if they gave them a name, it would be easier to remember which storm was which. So we still use that today. So if this, if our tropical cyclone from tropical disturbance to tropical depression forms into a tropical storm, I know I just said tropical a lot, but once it reaches tropical storm at that 39 miles per hour, it's when it gets its name. And if it reaches that strength, if it's in the central Pacific between 140 and 180, the date line, then it will receive a Hawaiian name. So they'll use the list 
um, in the Central Pacific, there's four lists um, that are used. So last year, the for, uh, we used the last name that was used was Emma. So this year, the next storm name would be Hone. If we have another system develop into at least tropical storm strength in the Central Pacific, then it would go to, to Iona. So in the Central Pacific, their lists are a little bit different than in the Eastern Pacific or in the Atlantic. We have four lists and it just follows the name down one right after another. But we don't switch from list one to list two or to list three from year to year. We just follow that name down. One thing you'll notice in this list also is that it is alphab alphabetical using the Hawaiian alphabet. Are any of your names on the list here? So now we'll talk about the Eastern Pacific storms. And you, because you've heard, right, about Hurricane Isel or Hurricane Darby or Hurricane Lane, and you're saying, well, all of those were by Hawaii, but they didn't have a Hawaiian name. And that's because they reached her, uh, tropical storm strength within the Eastern Pacific, that area between the coast of Mexico um, and 140. So as that storm travels from east to west, it keeps its name. You can think about it like this. If you move from California to Hawaii, would you change your name or would you keep it? You would probably keep your name. And so our tropical cyclones do the same. Otherwise, it would get really confusing if they kept changing their name from basin to basin. So here's the 2020 list of hurricane names for the Eastern Pacific. So like I was saying before, it's a little bit different than how the Central Pacific does it. In the Eastern Pacific and in the Atlantic, they get a new list each year. And then those lists are reused every six years. But in this list, it'll start with A and then go through the alphabet, but it alternates between a boy name and a girl name. So this year it started with A, Amanda as a girl name, then goes to B for Boris, the boy name. But next year in 2021, it'll start with A like Alan as a boy name and then go to B like Barbara for a girl name. Also at the end of the 2020 season, they'll, they'll stop using this list. Unlike the Central Pacific, where they'll just continue down the list. They'll get a new list in 2021. So now it's time to quiz you guys a little bit on hurricane season. Do you know when the Central Pacific hurricane season is? John will launch a poll and you can take a guess. Is it May through November, December through April, June through November, or all year long? All right, looks like most people have voted. We'll clear up stuff and show you the results. Great. All right, so it looks like most of you picked the right answer. It is June through November. So it starts June 1st, which is only a couple days away, and then goes all the way through November 30th. So you better start looking into getting some of your supplies ready now. If you said any of the other times, really you're not wrong because we can see tropical cyclones in the Central Pacific at all times of the year. We generally though have the, bus the busiest time is usually between uh, the months of June and November with a peak in the later summer months. So the Central Pacific averages about four to five tropical cyclones per year. This doesn't mean that Hawaii is going to see four to five tropical cyclones per year. It means that there is usually four to five tropical cyclones within that boundary of 140 and the date line. So we'll go on to another quiz now. What are the hazards associated with hurricanes? High winds, storm surge, heavy rainfall, dangerous surf, or all of the above?
All right, we'll wait a few, few more seconds. All it's right. Like voted. All right, we'll close this and share the results. Wow, you guys are smart. You didn't fall into the trap because really it is all of the above. And you might be thinking, whoa, that's, that's a lot of things to remember. But that's why we come up with this mnemonic, SWIFT, where we've got S standing for storm, surge, and surf, W for wind, I and F for inland flooding, and T for tornadoes. So we've got one more quiz question coming up for you guys. What do you think the deadliest hazard is in the United States from hurricanes? So which hazards have caused the most deaths in the United States? Wind, storm surge, flooding, or tornadoes? Let's look at about half the people have voted. We'll give it a few more seconds. Get more folks. Okay. All right, well, none of you guys fell into our trap. Usually when we ask this question, everyone says wind because they're like, well, they're categorized off of wind, right? We've got category one, category two, category three. But if you're in a sturdy structure, usually you can protect yourselves from most of the hazards that come with strong winds. We're not saying that they don't produce any damage. You can take a picture, take a look at these pictures, like the one on the left, the wind picked up that board and drove it through the tree or it can knock down all the power lines. So, but if you're inside your sturdy structure, generally you can stay protected from the hazards due to wind. If you said storm surge or flooding, then you're correct. This is what most people don't think about. The water aspect to tropical cyclones is, you, is the deadliest. And this water can either mean storm surge, large waves, and flooding. So you might be asking yourself, what is storm surge? Storm surge is the amount of water above the normal tide level due to the hurricane. So as the hurricane moves forward, it pushes water with it, and that water then can pile up on the shore. So that storm surge is the amount above the normal tide level. The video playing is from the Big Island in 2007 from, of the storm surge from Flossy. Usually this beach is wide open, but during this time, it was completely covered in water. Another thing to think about, that bottom picture there is from Hurricane Aniki. Hurricane Aniki generated over six feet of storm surge. So that's probably taller than most of you. It's definitely taller than me. But think about standing on the beach, standing on an open beach, your favorite beach right now, but then that water is six feet above the normal level. That's pretty crazy. So you can probably see why water is really dangerous. Another part of the water is the large waves and rip currents. So even if the hurricane doesn't directly hit the islands, it still can produce large waves that come crashing on the shore. Do you think where those people are standing in that right picture is a smart area for them to be standing? No, right? It's pretty dangerous to stand that close to large crashing waves. So the video that was just playing was from when Hurricane Hector passed to the south of us. So it didn't hit us. It didn't bring strong winds to us, but it did provide really large surf along the south shores of the island. So it's really important to always remember to listen to ocean safety officials and the lifeguards about the conditions of the ocean, because you don't know uh, where those waves may be coming from. Another thing in the water category is the flooding rains. So this video playing is from Hurricane Lane back in 2018. It dumped a lot of water on the Big Island. It's always key to remember to turn around and don't drown because only one foot of water will lift a car and be able to float it. And you don't know the surface that you're driving on if the water is pretty deep and it can get pretty dangerous. So with Hurricane Lane, it dropped over 58 inches of rain on the Windward Big Island. That's almost five feet. That's just two inches short of five feet, which may be taller than some of you. So with that 58 inches, it moved Lane, Hurricane Lane into the second wettest tropical storm or tropical 
cyclone in the United States. Hawaii actually holds the top three positions for the wettest tropical cyclones in the United States. We have Hurricane Lane that came with 58 inches. And then we have Hiki from back in the 1950s that used to be in position two, but now it's in position three with 52 inches. And then Paul in 2000 that dropped almost 39 inches of rain. And remember only 12 inches, that one foot of water can lift your vehicle. So our last hazard that we'll talk about associated with hurricanes is tornadoes and water spouts. You may be thinking, what, a tornado within a hurricane? So this can happen because those outer bands that we talked about as part of the hurricane are made up of thunderstorms. And within those thunderstorms, there can be these tornadoes or areas with really tight vortex circulations with really isolated strong winds within them. And a water spout is really just a tornado that's over the water. So now we're going to pass it back to Vanessa and she's going to talk to us about forecasting these hurricanes. Vanessa, it looks like you're muted. Sorry. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Thanks, Leanne. So yeah, how do we predict and track hurricanes? One of the important things to start off with is getting observations from these hurricanes. And um, our, one of our key tools, especially since hurricanes occur over mostly over the oceans, is through satellites. And we have come a long way in the past 30, 40 years with satellite technology. Um, in the cartoon schematic on the uh, page that we're showing, there's also things called drop zones or radio zones. They're little weather uh, sensors. So we have a temperature and humidity and even a GPS on there so we can get um, wind speeds and directions and we uh, release these instruments or drop them from airplanes. Um, we also do uh, send in planes to go uh, with special sensors attached to the plane and even drop sensors from the planes into hurricanes as well. Talk a little bit more about that later. And we even get observations from ships and buoys out in the ocean. And if the hurricane comes close enough to land, we can um, see them on radio, radar and even our land base stations. And there's a couple images of what the radar looks like, the bottom right, and the images uh, from what the radar shows uh, where we can see the heavy rain um, from that. Also, these observations go into the models and our models are able to understand what the state of the atmosphere is and then move forward in time to give us a prediction of where they think that this hurricane will go. Next slide. So I mentioned that we send in airplanes to hurricanes. And yes, there is a job where we have pilots and meteorologists that fly into hurricanes for a living. A couple of the planes that we fly are the Gulf Stream 4 which flies over the hurricane. And this is the one that is dropping instruments into the hurricane so we can get a better detailed um, analysis of what the wind profile, what the temperature profile, and what the moisture profile is within this hurricane. The next airplane that we send, this one actually flies through the hurricane is the P3. And this is probably going to be the most intense bumpy ride of your life if you're lucky enough to get on that plane. Um, and uh, in the image in the bottom right, there's a little video of the P3 that punched through the eye wall of a hurricane. And you can see at the bottom, there's, you can see the bottom all the way through the top because there's very little winds, little clouds. And this is the ideal characteristic of what the eye looks like. Um, pretty impressive stuff. <laughs> and with that, I'll pass it back to Eric. Hi, everyone. It's Eric again. 
Um, so we talked a lot about uh, the hurricanes, uh, tropical storm, tropical depressions, um, tropical cyclones in general. We talked about uh, the tools we use from satellite imagery, from observations to um, airplane measurements. But one another factor about tropical cyclones uh, with our job is to, to make sure we tell everyone and communicate effectively about the forecast itself. Um, we can generate the forecast and we can um, it does any it does no good to anybody if you folks don't receive it. So we one of the most important aspects of our job is to work through the state uh, emergency management, also through all of our media channels. Um, from giving TV interviews to radio interviews, uh, newspaper interviews. Um, we also have social media. We post information to uh, Twitter and Facebook. So if you have those means uh, to do so, you can follow us at NWS Honolulu. So our main job is to really protect life and property um, by effectively communicating the uh, forecast to you. And we use all of these methods to relay this information to everyone across the state. So you can see Leanne in the bottom right picture, she's giving a uh, briefing uh, to emergency management. You can see the governor in the background and also our press conferences to tell you about the tropical cyclone season, along with uh, information on our website where you can see all the latest information and forecasts about all the different uh, tropical storms that might be in our basin. <clears throat> um, earlier, Leanne talked about um, our average uh, tropical cyclones across our basin at four to five. Well, this year for the 2020 uh, Central Pacific hurricane season, our outlook uh, this year is for uh, somewhere between two and six tropical cyclones uh, that might be anywhere within the Central Pacific basin. Uh, remember this, this value doesn't really tell us about how many tropical cyclones will affect Hawaii, but just a general guide to the overall season in the tropical uh, Central Pacific um, with the amount of tropical cyclones that we could be expecting this year. So 75% chance uh, that we have a near to be a low normal tropical cyclone activity, but also there's still a 25% chance that we do see an above normal tropical cyclone activity, but generally about two to six this year. So the next slide here, we're, we want people to really get ready for hurricanes. Uh, now is the time to start preparing. Remember, uh, June 1st is right around the corner in a couple days. Um, so we want everyone to really have their uh, hurricane kits ready. We want people to have a 14 day supply of uh, food, uh, water, prescription medications, um, anything for your pets, um, blankets, batteries, radios, flashlights, anything that you might need in case we lose power, in case we lose water. Um, in case there's a devastation across the islands. And we want people to make sure that they, they can survive uh, in an aftermath of uh, a potentially devastating scenario. So now is the time to prepare when things are all available. Um, I know we have to uh, deal with the, some of the, the COVID-19 things, but um, as long as you stay safe and out there wearing a mask and, and uh, you know do your social distancing, um, go out there and get your supplies ready for this hurricane hurricane season because um you know it's not really when and if a hurt it's not really if a hurricane occurs it's when when it does occur that you're really going to need these supplies so now's the time to really take action um so really get your kits together um if you and your family go through your kits at home tonight um you want to show us a picture you can tag us at uh, nws honolulu on facebook and uh, or twitter so we really like to see your, your action uh, plan and have everything ready. Um, also for, for anybody with kids, um, you can go to ready.gov uh, slash kids. And this has a, a good listing of uh, different activities that you can do, um, that you can do before, during, and after uh, weather scenarios um, that could be potential disasters. So finally, we, uh, we wanna thank you for joining us. Um, on this uh, webinar. We're gonna stick around here for any last minute questions. So all of us, uh, either Leanne, John, Vanessa, or I will be um, really happy to answer any questions that you may have. And I'll pass it back to John for closing remarks. Great, thank you, Eric. Uh, we, we appreciate you uh, joining us for this. If you do have any questions, uh, please type them into the, the question box. We'll read them off and answer them. Or if you want to ask a question, click the raise your hand button. We'll unmute you and give you a chance to ask your question directly.
Now, earlier, when you started this presentation, we, we each talked a little bit about what got us into meteorology. Um, a lot of times, the questions that we get is, what do we like about our jobs? Um, we got that one before. And uh, for me, I, I like this sort of interaction. I like talking to people about the weather, and I like helping them learn what to do and how to prepare for dangerous weather so it won't impact them as much. Like Eric said, if you have a hurricane kit prepared ahead of time, be in a much better situation than if a hurricane hits and you run out of food and water and are, are left without anything on hand. So doing that ahead of time really helps. I don't know, any of our other speakers, if you wanna talk about what you like about your job? Sure. I can go ahead. Uh, the thing I like about being a meteorologist and um, what's really pushed me forward is that it's, it's a lifelong learning skill and everybody's interested in what the weather is going to be like and um, it's always a good conversation and it's something that I can improve throughout my career and, um, and, always, and there's always something interesting that's happening around the world or um, things that you can continue to learn and stay focused on. So for me, I like um, the aspect of my job um, is also to, to make sure the data flows efficiently across all of our offices. So any satellite data that comes in uh, from space uh, down to Earth, um, I make sure that all that data is uh, getting to all of our offices. So the, uh, there's a lot of uh, computer programming work that, that's involved um, with uh, a meteorologist job that, that's a separate field that some people can get into. Um, so really, if you, if you have an interest or a passion in meteorology, but you also have a passion in, in computer science, um, that's another aspect. Um, of a potential career that, that uh, is available out there, um, as long as you, if you can learn some of the different programming languages, such as uh, Python, Java, uh, we do a lot of stuff with Linux as well. So um, definitely a, a really diverse, um, diverse career um, within the field of meteorology and the National Weather Service. And I'll finish it up with saying that what I like about my job is being able to work with you guys and work with the public and work with emergency managers and helping everyone understand what those what the hazard is and what the impacts it's going to bring. Because if we just say that it's going to rain six inches, do we know if that's harmful to us? Is it not? Is it great? So I like being able to communicate what that means to you. So another thing, another area to study like Eric mentioned, studying computer science along with meteorology. Another area to study would be communications, being able to effectively deliver your messages. Well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in. So I guess uh, once again, I'll thank you for joining us and listening to this webinar. Uh, to all of our speakers, thank you for for, for speaking as well. We, we very much appreciate your time. And uh, hopefully we can go out and make sure we're all stocked up with our hurricane kits and get ready for hurricane season, which starts on June 1st. So with that, I'll say have a good afternoon. And once again, thank you for joining us. Mahalo. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>